Andy didn't have time to teach me all the steps of this dance, but I'm a quick study. Charmed was a landmark show in terms of female empowerment and representation, not just in the fantasy genre, but also television as a whole. And despite some frustrating decisions made in the writing, I ultimately stand by most of its messages, which I still think is pretty impressive for eight seasons of 22 episodes to deal with. But while it is beloved, and holds up very well with how it wrote complex, varied female characters who were shown as strong and virtuous as well as traditionally feminine, it's unfortunately a different story with the male characters. Okay. In eight seasons, there were six series regulars with a Y chromosome. Andy Trudeau wasn't on the show long enough to be derailed. Dan Gordon was a satellite love interest who overstayed his welcome. Leo Wyatt was basically eye candy with competency and didn't come into his own until season four. Cole Turner... Well, watch my salty rant if you want my thoughts on that dumpster fire. Chris Perry suffered at first from not having a clear direction before rebounding. So what about Daryl Morris? The Daryl character was part of the show from the first episode, although he didn't actually appear in the original unaired pilot, where Andy seemed to act alone. He was added in to give Andy a partner to bounce ideas off, since it was the 90s and the Mulder Scully police pairing was all the rage in supernatural shows. You stopped saying prove for a reason. You thought she was hiding something from you. How do you know she wasn't hiding something like this? To elaborate, Andy was the believer in the supernatural, and is introduced investigating the murder of a witch later starting to get suspicious of Prue as all these unexplainable things start happening around her. Daryl, meanwhile, is the skeptic, adding some conflict to Andy's suspicions, but mostly just acting as a sounding board for his ideas and theories. Maybe her sister was right. Maybe your personal feelings are getting in the way. He stays mostly in the supporting partner role until Andy's surprising death at the end of the season, and in the next there are several episodes of him knowing something is sus about the sisters, but covering for them because of a promise to his friend. Why did you cover for us when Andy died at the house? Because he asked me to. In the episode She's a Man, Baby, a Man, he learns about the existence of the supernatural, and in Miss Hellfire, sisters confess their secret to him. Thus, he becomes their go-to guy on the police, getting them access to crime scenes caused by demons and witches, and sometimes recruiting them for help with unusual cases. Field of expertise? We're psychics. He's entirely in a supporting role until the end of season 6, in which he gets supernaturally framed for a crime and nearly given a lethal injection, afterwards swearing off helping the sisters again. I'm not doing anymore. Forget it. But in season 7, with the arrival of FBI agent Kyle Brody, who knows about the existence of magic, and conflict with the ambitious Inspector Sheridan, who wants to bust the sisters for all the unsolved cases linking back to them, he's forced to work with them again. But you gotta admit, you sort of miss it, don't you? Baby? They do repair their friendship, but by the end of the season, his covering for them puts his job in jeopardy, and worries his wife Sheila, who is getting afraid of what helping the sisters might result in. When is the time? When I bring our kids to jail to see you or to your funeral? He's on the scene for a showdown with Homeland Security outside the manor as the sisters battle Zanku for control of the Nexus, and his final appearance in the series is realising that the sisters have faked their deaths, and smiling. Due to budget cuts, he doesn't appear in Season 8, and it's mentioned he now lives on the East Coast. So yeah, a series regular for seven seasons, but also the cast member most likely to miss episodes at a time, never getting an arc that doesn't involve him playing a supporting role, and a series of weird choices that make him often feel more like a plot device than a character. So first we have to talk about tokenism. Tokenism usually refers to the presence of a minority, or specifically a character besides a white, straight, cisgendered, abled man, or indeed woman if the work is female-centric. You can even extend it to accents and body type. This isn't just referring to the presence of minority characters in a story. For example, Lisa Turtle in Saved by the Bell was originally conceived as a white Jewish-American princess, with Lark Voorhees just giving the best audition. So in that event, there was a black character simply because they wanted her actress on the show. And there's also the Danny Boyle movie Sunshine, which Michelle Yeoh's agent even refused to put her up for, saying there was no room for Asian faces in there. But then her audition was so good she was told she could have whatever part she wanted. We need to limit our exertions. Tokenism, on the other hand, is setting out to put a minority in the cast for the purposes of getting diversity points. And obviously intent is very hard to read here, because how do you draw the line between attempting to give genuine representation and just shoving a brown person in there to silence critics and meet a quota? Tokenism tends to be retroactively assigned, usually as a response to bad writing. 
because a creator doesn't want to be branded as racist, sexist, ableist, homophobic, or all of the above, and the media does love platforming bad faith critics, there's often an overcompensation by making the minority character a near flawless saint who's the smartest and most competent at everything, while also being kind and considerate. And sometimes this is done with good intentions. Sidney Poitier was the first African American leading man, and he received criticism for the majority of his roles being near demigods of human perfection but because it was the 1960s and racial caricatures were still the norm, not to mention him being the only black man getting lead roles, he specifically turned down more flawed characters in the hopes that showing African Americans in a positive light would bury the old stereotypes. No, no, we gotta get organized now, no. The Rugrats cartoon introduced Susie Carmichael in season two, and her actress Cree Summer was told that this three-year-old child had to sound very smart and well-spoken so she could be a good role model and her parents were suspiciously more successful and competent than those of the other white babies. You studied at the Cordon Bleu? Well, I didn't study there, actually. I was a guest lecturer. For what it's worth, the underrated spin-off All Grown Up worked hard to make Susie a better rounded character, presumably because they now had Kimmy in the main cast, and that's usually the magic solution to avoid accusations of tokenism. Just add in more characters so that one person isn't meant to stand in for the whole experience, because, you know, no experience is a monolith. So this whole thing isn't minority characters bad, and also the flip side of simply having diversity automatically making something good. A certain reboot comes to mind. It's all about writing the characters the same way you would ones from the majority, and also involving writers from that experience, or at least doing research to represent it accurately. To summarise the tangent I just got devoured by, write good characters. Daryl in Charmed thankfully avoids many of the pitfalls that often befall a token minority. He's not a flawless saint. Yes, he's a strong character and very good at his job, but he's able to be fallible and need help just as many times as he gives it. He has a rounded personality and never once feels like a cipher. Stop protecting me, Prue. You have absolutely no idea. I'm an imaginative guy. I have plenty of ideas. He's defined more by his work and how it connects him to the sisters than simply being their friend. While they do become friends by the time of Season 3, it's through working together rather than him just being their satellite bestie there to offer advice and support. But he does like the jiggle. Do you know the jiggle? Of course I know the jiggle. I'm a father. We know plenty about him, since Season 2 reveals that he's a father, and his wife Sheila eventually starts appearing on screen. We even get to meet his father in a flashback to the 1960s, where Dorian Gregory really gets to have fun. Leave it to the man who locked the brother up with the crazies. Shh! <laughs> Andy's death arguably did lots for the character, since it gave Daryl a role only he could fill, and allowed him to get in on the action too. Andy is gone, but I'm not Andy. Episodes like All Halliwell's Eve see him taking on Grimlocks to protect the neighbourhood children while the sisters are stuck in the 1600s, and it's clear that Leo wouldn't have succeeded without him. Stay here, finish that potion. No matter what happens, you make sure you bring the girls home safe. In Charmed again, he intervenes to try and save the sisters from another cop who thinks they're responsible for Prue's death. They're the best people I've ever met. They'll do more good than you'll ever know. I cost them their sister. In A Page from the Past, he gets to have an opposing viewpoint and actually be quite unsympathetic in wanting Phoebe and Cole take the fall for crimes committed by ghosts possessing them, only agreeing to cover for them when he realises it might reflect badly on him. Little Monsters sees him getting a subplot where Paige casts an invincibility spell on him to save a hostage situation. This is a great character we got here. He was written just fine. So what is the Daryl problem? I don't know if it's me, but in 70% of Daryl's scenes, I tend to feel like we're getting a crossover with another show. Like, there seems to be a whole other story playing out off-screen that we're just never seeing. Bear with me. Let me guess, your psychic friends? He has to deal with his co-workers thinking less of him for constantly bringing the sisters to crime scenes pretending they're psychics, including worrying that it might be costing him a promotion. Look, it's taken me a long time to lose the freaky deaky rapper. No offense, but I don't need it back right now. He likely also has to explain away some supernatural crimes that otherwise don't add up. And in Season 7, he's said to be having issues with his wife, who disapproved of him not helping the sisters like he used to, but this is all entirely off-screen. Go easy on him, his wife's had him sleeping on the couch all week. Sheila does not appear from the first part of the Season 6 finale until the first part of the Season 7 finale, in which she's made a major character jump. She's first like... You girls are like family to us. You don't turn your back on family. And then, like... It's not your fight, Daryl. It's theirs. And sure, she could realistically have developed in this direction, 
But this happens completely off screen, reflecting the overhanging problem with Daryl. Why didn't we see him having conversations with her about this? Why didn't we see their home life together? Why weren't we, the audience, invited to see these intimate moments so that when Sheila came to the aforementioned conclusion, we immediately understand how she arrived there? Obviously, there were probably budget considerations to think of, since their house would be another set or location, but that's not an insurmountable problem. The number one rule of screenwriting is show, don't tell, and so many of Daryl's issues that he deals with are only given to a second hand making him feel rather disconnected from the main plot. I'm up for promotion, and if I get passed over this time, there's not going to be a next time. We don't even see where he lives until something wicker this way goes, which is his last episode in the series. The show did so well at avoiding the trap of making him feel like a character who only exists to support the leads, but alas, didn't do as good a job at integrating him into the main action. We could have even got a lower deck style episode showing his home life and the perspective of him trying to preserve the masquerade. We were also kind of robbed of at least a mini-arc of him and Cole trying to be buddy cops in Season 4. I want to help with your investigations. As a cop? On my own. Because the arcs he was involved with... The Season 6 premiere has the weirdest writing choice in the whole show. I can actually rationalise Phoebe's abusive behaviour in Season 5 and Paige's ish in Season 4, and I did a whole video defending Billy's sudden heel turn, but I don't get what the writers were going for here. You're serious, aren't you? The Charmed Ones want to sneak into Valhalla to rescue Leo disguised as Valkyries, and they need to do so with the soul of a warrior. Daryl's been a cop for years, so he counts, but he refuses to because he's iffy about going into a coma for two hours, which is a little selfish about him since it is about rescuing Leo, but hey, they asked. He gave his answer. No, I, I ain't doing it. Daryl, please. Do they respect his consent and boundaries like the heroic protagonists they're supposed to be? And like how Phoebe squawked about Cole not doing for her in Season 5? Nope, they basically kill him anyway, regardless of what he actually wanted. That's just great. Is there any fallout from this? Well, kind of, but you'll have to headcanon it. Which we'll get to. I just don't get what they were going for here. Are we meant to side with the sisters for violating Daryl's body? Are we meant to side with him for refusing to help Leo? They should have just had him agree or make Crispy the one to do this, with the sisters not finding out until later. Well, in that case, you're gonna kill me too. Despite this being a time where Daryl gets to be included in the adventure, he gets turned into a living MacGuffin to be used by the others for the plot to happen, rather than influencing it by his own decisions. Take the fall. What fall? <laughs> they also don't commit to the fallout that would realistically happen from this. Daryl doesn't call Phoebe and Paige on this. There's no drama surrounding a prominent cop just being unconscious in an alleyway for two hours, and more time is spent on Leo's anger at Chris. And this is just why season six is the worst, or at least the first half, because Daryl does get some focus later. That's not what happened. The episode Crimes and Witch Demeanors sees Daryl being framed as a scapegoat by the cleaners thanks to an exposure risk. And this is a great episode, centering Daryl as someone for the sisters to help and save, treating him with plenty of importance in the narrative. And we're here to let you know that we're not going to sit around and watch you frame our friend. We don't get a lot of scenes from his perspective, but the episode is all about saving him. And when offered the chance to escape with Piper, he turns it down in favour of honouring the law. Which, although a powerful moment for him, became a bit harsher on my most recent rewatch, when I realised that the cleaners messed with his mind to make him think he broke the law, so he was really supernaturally brainwashed into thinking he was facing consequences of his own actions. That's not right. I'm not fugitive. And damn, would I have loved an arc where he becomes a fugitive and maybe has to hide out in magic school and help innocents from there while trying to clear his name? Might not have worked within the confines of the episode's conventions, but still. And I like how, although there's a reset button to exonerate him at the end, this does have lasting consequences, as he remembers the experience and decides he's not going to cover for the sisters anymore. I changed. I saw the light. This does allow him to feel more like an independent character with his own thoughts and feelings, since his decision not to help the sisters anymore is actually pretty selfish if you think about it, but also understandable, considering he nearly died and got brainwashed into thinking he should die. And with the sisters themselves acknowledging his perspective, but also reminding him of their own, we got some nice, fully formed conflict where you can see both sides. I've got a family to think about too, you know. It doesn't come into play too much in the season 6 finale, which is more about the hijinks surrounding an evil mirror universe, but we do get to see Daryl included in the adventure for a change. Sheila, who? <laughs> 
I'm sure he only has one scene in the evil universe where he gets threatened by the sisters, but Dorian gets to shake it up, and you can tell he's having fun in the extreme good world too. Listen, young man, we can do this the easy way or the hard way. Your choice. Season 7 gets more mileage out of Daryl, and as much as we all wish he could have been involved in Season 8, it at least gives him something in his last year as a regular. If you want to help Sheridan hang us out to dry, that's your business, but this is not about that. This is about people who are in trouble, so are you going to help us or not? And this is great. He gets drawn back into the world of the supernatural by circumstance, both when Inspector Sheridan starts investigating the sisters, and when Agent Brody comes onto the scene as well. This is great character conflict, where he doesn't want to be part of the magical world again, but he also can't let good women get unfairly punished by the law, or work with a shady FBI agent. And his refusal to help the sisters is what allows for significant parts of the plot to happen, since in Sticks Feet Under it's Agent Brody who intervenes to help Piper, and thus involve him in the Avatar arc, and then him looking into Sheridan's disappearance helps expose that Brody isn't the most trustworthy source. I told you Brody did something to her. I also have to give Season 7 its credit for how it took the ghastliness that Season 6 left us with and making a coherent story arc out of it, and fixing most of the issues. And then that's it. It's over. For all of us. Sure, he's suspiciously left out of the three episodes dealing with the Avatars creating Utopia, and it would be something to see how a man whose livelihood is fighting crime would react to the idea of a world without conflict, but he still gets plenty more. The episode Show Rules lets us meet his old mentor, and he is very involved in the two-part finale. You can't run from this anymore. And you can't protect them anymore either. And in hindsight, the fact that the showrunners didn't know that they'd be coming back for season 8 forced them to write a good resolution for Daryl just in case. And I love it. Now, I don't know what these women have on you. They don't have anything on me. Then why are you protecting them? Gets to have scenes that are just about him, where he has his own perspective, the plot can only happen because of his choices, he gets to state his case, he gets to have low moments like any rounded character, and he ultimately steps it up. But if we're about building a better future for our family, then I have to help the sisters. Isn't that what they're fighting for? I was going to say that it was a little annoying that Daryl didn't get to fight Zanku, but then I realised. The whole purpose of the Agent Brody and Inspector Sheridan characters are to serve as foils to Daryl. All three are mortals involved with law enforcement, and they all eventually learn about magic. Brody wants to use it to win a battle he's been fighting in his head ever since he was seven, Sheridan misplaces her anger and sets about exposing magic, thinking she's fighting the good fight, but more likely thinking about the ego boost of being the one to do it. Get out of there, Inspector. We'll try again later. Let me just check the attic. Both of them learn about the supernatural and think mainly of what it can do for them. Daryl, on the other hand, learns about it and continues to do what he's always done and help people, just in a new way, now knowing about another world that needs protecting too. He doesn't try to get power for himself or seek to use magic to get even with a nemesis. If he ever gets involved with it, it's entirely to help innocence, the same as the sisters. And the dynamic between them is all about mutual respect. The missing girls and Jeff Carlton. We're working on it. They count on him to protect the mortals from human crime, while he counts on them to do the same for supernatural issues. So Daryl's last contribution to the story shouldn't be fighting a demon or having an action scene. I wouldn't go in just yet if I were you keeping Homeland Security at bay. Allowing the sisters to get rid of Zanku without worrying about human interference is a perfect underline for how Daryl's story should end. We so underrate the support role, and how important it is, especially since not everyone can be the heavy hitter in real life. Hold my hand, nothing can hurt us we're together. There's a lot of importance to the character who shows up just to be there and help in their own way. You know, I still don't know how to dance. I'll show you how. Just be there. Like Leo in the healer and motivational role, Daryl's support and help is essential in saving the day and protecting the innocent. And the season 7 finale makes it clear that the sisters can't do their thing without him. I can't just leave them high and dry. Daryl ultimately did have his own role to play in Charmed, and while the show often forgot that and acted as though he was a tool to be used whenever the plot required him, I can at least be grateful that season 7 ironed out the majority of issues I had. And sure, it would have been nice to see him in Season 8 and keeping the secret again, but the Season 7 finale felt like the best resolution to his story. Please, promise me this will be the last time. I promise. He doesn't turn his back on them completely, but he honours the idea that he has his own life to live, and a family that needs him just as much as the sisters, and in doing so, reaffirms that he's his own person, and not just someone for them to use. 
our last images of him guessing that the Halliwells are still alive and keeping the secret once again are kind of perfect in that regard. Charmed did have many problems with various characters, but thankfully the Daryl problem did not go the same way as the Cole one, and his exit felt like five simple words honouring his tenure on the show. Thank you for your service. <laughs> well, alright. <laughs> alright.